Sabbath Church. It's a tremendous privilege for me to be here with you again. And uh, I want to thank you for coming out. I want to thank all of our uh, visitors and also all the people who are watching this service and who are watching this sermon by live streaming. And we have uh, friends from Sweden. We have friends from Hungary. We have friends from the United States from Canada and from all over the world watching us and joining us in our worship. So I hope they will see that uh, Chancellor Church is a powerful church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, that's what I think. And uh, thank you for the children's story. I think uh, th this children's story that we, which we now heard is, uh, a, it was heating up the sermon, so to speak. Because the topic of the sermon is, and the title, Ben Carson and the ABCs of Seventh-day Adventism. Ben Carson and the ABCs of Seventh-day Adventism. Now before we start, let us begin with a short word of prayer. And let us see where God will take us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this day, for your holy day. And Father, I'm not worthy to stand before your people and not to stand before you. Yet Father in heaven, we pray for a message from heaven. We pray that you will speak to our hearts today. Amen. And Father in heaven, may you increase and may I decrease. Amen. And let us see Jesus and Jesus alone today. Yes. Jesus' name, amen. amen. When I say Ben Carson, of course you have seen the pictures now. How many of you recognize who this man is? Let me see. You know, almost all the hands come up. Almost all the hands come up. Um, you know, of course, with Seventh-day Adventists, this is pretty easy. But as you may know, the name of Ben Carson and the person Ben Carson himself has become a very hot topic lately, especially in North, uh, North America. As you may have heard, Ben Carson is running for the presidency of the United States of America. And since this summer, Ben Carson has become one of the leading candidates uh, for the, for become in the Republican Party. And this should grab our attention, at least for a number of reasons. Number one is that it seems to be the case that the American people are tired of the same old people and the same old policies and, uh, you know, no results are coming. And so the American people are just fed up. And what is interesting is that Ben Carson, as you know, he has no political background. He has no polit political career. He is not a politician. And he is one of the leading candidates in the Republican Party. Him and Donald Trump running shoulder to shoulder. It is, it's like a TV show. And so this is taking place. But. Another reason, and I think this is more important, and this is why our sermon is getting heated up again, is that as you may know, Ben Carson is a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And as far as I'm concerned, um, there's been no Seventh-day Adventist who has been a U.S. president. Am I correct? Yes. No Seventh-day Adventist has been a U.S. president. And uh, I would just wanted to... Smelt, uh, melt in, you know what? <sighs> Seventh-day Adventist running for the highest office <laughs> in the United States. And as you may take a look at it, for this presidential campaign with prophetic perspective and with a prophetic eye, this should indeed grab your attention. Because you must admit that in serious times that we are living in, this is happening. In times that we are living in where we are seeing the predictions of Jesus, 
the signs of the times being fulfilled right before our very eyes. And I believe that this, the most honest conclusion and the most logical conclusion that we can make is that indeed that Jesus is coming again. What do you say? I truly believe I have said it many times and I will say it until I die or until I don't have a voice that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. And this is happening. This is happening. You say, what kind of signs are you talking about? Well, like talking about catastrophic natural disasters which are destroying cities, countries, and homes of tens of millions of people all around the world. I'm talking about whole financial systems, international, national, or otherwise, being on the brink and the cliff of collapse, all because of greed and disgusting selfishness. I'm talking about certain societies that are wholeheartedly embracing lifestyles that are contradictory to God's word and which brought the very judgments of God in ancient times. I'm talking about our culture which beats its breast for tolerance and equality, yet it does not realize that this tolerant society has become very intolerant towards Bible-believing Christians. I'm talking about our culture which prouds itself in political correctness or uh, open-mindedness, but so much that your brain has fallen out because of this open-mindedness. I'm talking about such a moral decay, such a moral degeneration, that especially my generation experiencing at the moment, where we are being brainwashed by Hollywood and the music industry, and even by so-called higher education, where we are thought to believe that what that which God has said is good and evil is actually good and right is actually evil and bad. And that which is actually evil and bad turns out to be good and right. I'm talking about rumors of wars and even of wars themselves that threaten the survival of humanity. We are living in a time when groups of violent extremists are ready to wipe out the majority of the inhabitants of the planet simply because they do not share their philosophy of life. And I think we saw what happened in Paris yesterday. The reality of this violent extremism. And as a matter of fact, we are living in a time when governments all around the world, and yes, even in this country, understand the threat and the dangers of violent extremism. But in order to secure, in order to get security for the people, they want to limit your freedom and thus are trying to plunge in this big brother society, which not only George Orwell predicted, but the book of Revelation. So, so this is the times that we are living in, yet I, I don't believe we should be afraid of, of, of what is happening. You know why? Because Jesus has already said it. Jesus has already predicted, this is gonna happen. Read the Bible, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, Revelation 13, it's all said, and it has all been predicted. But in these fascinating times, we see a Seventh-day Adventist running for the presidency of the United States. And as Carson is getting more and more popular, mass media has picked up, or rather picked on, his religious faith. And I could just give you article after article after article from CNN, BBC, uh, what do you have? ABC, NBC, MSM, all these CCTV channels, right? All these articles, they are now writing articles about who are these Adventists? Who are these Adventists? You know, some of them are good, some of them are not good. Yet, interestingly enough, what happens to be the case is that Adventists have come to the forefront, at least in North America and in West, because of, what, uh, because of the run that Ben Carson is doing. And by the way, did you know that this was prophesied? Did you know that this was prophesied? Not that Ben Carson would run for, you know, 
U.S. presidency. No, no, I'm not talking about that. But that Adventist, at the end of this world's history, would come to the forefront. I'm going to read you a long quote from a book called Maranatha. It's written by Ellen White, and I believe it's on page 218. This is a longer quote, but I want to read it because I haven't read this quote, you know. And I hope this is going to be a new quote for you. So let me read it. And this is going to open up the topic for our sermon today. Pretty easy. What is the topic? What is the title? Oh, good, 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 good. You, you didn't forget. Good. Now, the quote, the quote starts like this. Our people have been regarded as too insignificant to be worthy of notice. How many of you? <laughs> That's is, that, that is the case. Every time we go door knocking or every time we are doing some kind of work, say, who are you guys? We are Christians. Yeah, but who are you guys? We are Seventh-day Adventists. You say, who? Who? Are you, are you the LSD people? No, 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 no. We are SDAs. LSD is something else. There are LDS, Letter Day Saints. But she says, our people have been regarded as too insignificant to be worthy of notice. But a change will come. In other words, the world and even the Christian church, they don't seem to notice us. You know, what are you guys doing over there? But she says, but a change will come. And it's the Christian world that is now making movements. She continues, every position of truth, how many positions? Every, every position of truth taken by our people as we come to the forefront of the world will bear the criticisms of the greatest minds. The highest of the world's great men will be brought in contact with truth and therefore every position should be should. Uh, sh we should take should be critically examined and tested by the scriptures so as we come to the for forefront of the world as you as you may see with Ben Carson they attack his faith you believe in creation what are you talking about everybody believes in their evolution and she says the time is gonna come an advent is gonna come to the forefront and who are going to criticize our beliefs somebody on the street no the greatest minds the professors, the philosophers, the theologians are going to say, what is this? She continues. Now we seem to be unnoticed. Isn't that good? We don't need to be worried about media attention. BBC is not knocking on our door, right? Writing an article. So who are you guys Adventists? Now we seem to be unnoticed. We can come to church and we can leave. No big problem, no big anything. Now we seem to be unnoticed, but this will not always be. I'm still quoting. But this will not always be. Movements are at work to bring us to the front. And listen to this. And if our theories of truth can be picked to pieces by historians or the world's greatest men, it will be. So she says, as we will come to the forefront, and our truth will be, what? Examined, critiqued. She says, if we will not be able to present the truth as it is, what is going to happen? Is that, you know, with the pick, pick to pieces? Picked to pieces. And she says, if that could happen, it will be done. What does that tell us? about our knowledge of the truth. How is your reading of scripture going? Is it on, only on the surface level? Or as you wake up in the morning, you say, God, give me a message. I want to be rooted in your word. Is that our experience now? Because if that is not our experience now, don't think that we are going to have that experience when we will stand up towards the greatest man upon this earth. We seem to be unnoticed at the moment. And we should thank God for that. 
We should thank God that we still have our freedoms and our liberties to study and be rooted in the Word. That will not always be. So what is the solution then? She continues. We must individually. What is the word? We must individually know for ourselves what is truth. Do you know what is truth? The truth is Jesus. The truth is the Bible. She continues, and be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have with meekness and fear, not in a proud, boasting self-sufficiency, but with the Spirit of Christ. We are nearing the time when we shall stand individually alone to answer for our beliefs. We shall be attacked on every point. We shall be tried to the utmost. We do not want to hold our faith simply because it was handed down to us by our fathers. Such a faith will not stand the terrible test that is before us. Listen to this. We want to know why we are Seventh-day Adventists. Do we want to know why we are Seventh-day Adventists? What real reason we have for coming out from the world as a separated and distinct people? The powers of darkness will open their batteries upon us. And all who are indifferent and careless, who have set their affections on their earthly treasure, and who have not cared to understand in God's dealings with His people, will be ready victims. No power but a knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus will ever make us steadfast. But with this, one may chase a thousand and two put ten thousand. To flight. So what she basically says in this long quote, and I, and I felt inclined to read this quote to you, because I haven't read it, and it came as a shock to me. What, are we truly going to come to the front of the world, and will all of our points be criticized and examined? Will I be able to answer? And the answer is yes, if I am rooted in the Word, if I know what I believe in. And she says, now is the time to know why we are Seventh-day Adventists. I, I recognize that there are some people here who are not Seventh-day Adventists. And I recognize the fact that there are many people who are watching on the internet that are not Seventh-day Adventists. I recognize that. But what we are going to do in this sermon today is that I want to study this question. I want to study why we are Seventh-day Adventist? Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Why am I a Seventh-day Adventist? Are you with me? And she says that the argument which is going to bring silence upon the people who are going to examine our points is this. And this is crucial for our sermon now. And that is a knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. Let us say that together. We're going to hear that a lot. But let us say that together. One, two, three. A knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. A knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus, she says, is going to bring silence upon the people who are going to examine our faith. Which tells me, and now it comes very important, it tells me it's not only important to know the truth intellectually, but it's important to present the truth as it is in Jesus. Amen. In other words, you don't just present information after information after information, but you present it in a Bible-based, Christ-centered way. Are we able to do it? Let us study. Let us study. You see, I don't believe that... Uh, I believe this. Let me say this. I believe that what happens with Ben Carson and the presidency, if there is one, I don't want to say this, but you know, God may have allowed him just for this, for the truth of God's word to go out in just two or three days. Amen. In the most powerful way. I'm CNN, BBC, ABC, all of these CBBCs. <laughs> in, just in two days, it just... Went out. The truth of God's word went out. And people were, you know, Adventists, who are they? And as I was reading 
the articles. And I was, as I was reading the comments, and as I was reading um, the interviews and listened to some of these things, I was wondering to myself, if I, if I am able to present to people the knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus, am I able to present to people why I have chosen to be a Seventh-day Adventist? Are you? Am I? Let us study. Let us study. Well, if you read some of the articles, as I have done, Seventh-day Adventists are associated with at least three things. At least three things. Could, could be more, but I, I could get it down into three. Healthy lifestyle. We should praise God for a healthy lifestyle. Absolutely. You know, as scientists are doing their researches, they are coming to the conclusion that a plant-based diet is the most healthiest. And this is something that we have, as Seventh-day Adventist, Adventists, been blessed by having it since the 1860s. Can you believe that? Yes. 1860s. And now science is catching up with what um, we believe. So we should praise God. Number two is humanitarian work. And we should praise God for ADRA and all the humanitarian work that we are doing, either in other countries or even in this country. Trying to help people. And of course, number three is, what do you think? Sabbath. Sabbath. And we should praise God for uh, letting us understand the truth about the seventh day Sabbath. And we will study the Sabbath soon. But it is my humble opinion that while we should praise God for giving us a healthy lifestyle and for giving us the opportunity to help humanity and for giving us the truth about the Seventh-day Sabbath, I believe that the core beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is so much more than a social club based upon veg vegeta vegetarianism. Because if you think about it, there are many people who are not Seventh-day Adventists but are vegetarians. <laughs> Are you, are you with me? Yes. And you don't need to be a vegetarian in order to become a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> so what about the first point? What about the second? Humanitarian work. Are only Seventh-day Adventists doing humanitarian work? No. There are so many people. Other Christians from other religions, even non-religious people, are doing humanitarian work. Now, we do humanitarian work because of our relationship with Jesus... But is humanitarian work that which encapsulates who we are? What about the Sabbath? Are there other people who keep the Sabbath? We have the Jews. We have the Messianic Jews. We have the Seventh-day Baptists. We have the people from Church of God. There are many people who are now understanding... Um, the truth about the seventh day Sabbath. So what is it that I believe should come first? What is it that should come first? You know, when you think about it, when CNN or BBC would come to this church to make an article, what would you like that the first thing that they put up is that seventh day Adventists are first and foremost associated with? Jesus. Jesus. I want people to understand and for you to remember for the rest of the sermon is that our beliefs are based upon solely upon the Bible and that all of our beliefs are all centered in the person of Jesus Christ and the cross. I want to say that again. That all our beliefs are all centered in the person of of Jesus Christ and the cross. Amen. And I'm doing this study because I know that there are many, there are many misunderstandings and misconceptions of who these Adventists are. And that is why we're going to study now. You know, if there is anything I wish people would see when they look at us, is that the first thing is Jesus. Beliefs, they see Jesus in the beliefs. 
When they see vegetarian lifestyle, they see Jesus. When they see our humanitarian work, that they see Jesus. When they see the Sabbath, they see Jesus in the Sabbath. When they see you, when they see me, that they see Jesus. Amen. So go with me please to our scripture reading that is in uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. What verse are we going to? Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 8. And if you are there, please say, Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 8. The Bible says, well, I st still hear some people wrestling with the scriptures, with the pages. Now, that's the best sound a preacher can have, except Amen. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Not of works, verse 9, lest anyone should boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, on a dull, sultry day some years ago, a young man was seated in a railway train with a clergyman across the aisle reading the daily paper. The young man, a recent convert to Christianity, was gazing out on the window in happy contemplation when he began to sing quietly the gospel song, Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. When he came to the end of the first stanza, the minister softly joined in the refrain and then remarked, I take it, young man, that you are a Christian. Yes, sir. The young man replied, How long is it since you were redeemed? Asked the minister. Nineteen hundred years ago came the prompt reply. But, but... I mean, said the preacher a little, little nonplussed, how long since you yourself were redeemed? Again, the new convert replied, 1900 years ago, sir. With this answer, the conversation lapsed and the minister resumed his reading. As the lad was about to leave the train, he said, pardon me, sir. I did not wish to appear smart or clever in my reply just now. I meant what I said. I was redeemed 1900 years ago, but, but it was only last year that I had found it out. Amen. How's it with you? Have you found out that you have been redeemed? If not, this is the day of salvation, friends. This is the day of salvation. The very verses that we just read from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 summarizes the whole science of the plan of salvation and what the Bible is all about. The fact that as we as sinners who have transgressed God's law ran away from God and we deserve to die, not because it is God who is punishing us, but simply because that the wages of sin is death. death. The very consequences of our actions are telling us of death. But God in His graciousness, God in His love through the person of Jesus Christ offers you, offers me, offers the whole of humanity a second chance. No, 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 a third chance. No, 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 a fifth or tenth chance. All a second chance coming back to God, coming back to Jesus. Friends, this is just mind-boggling. That the God of the universe would become a human being and die for yours and my sins. The very sins that I have committed. The very sins that I have done. And He hangs upon that cross. Blooded, bruised, beaten, tortured. And there He hangs for you and for me. 
This is too good to be true. That's why the gospel means good news. And this happens all by grace. This happens all by faith alone. And this happens all by Jesus and Jesus alone. I believe that these verses that we just now read lay the foundation for Seventh-day Adventist thinking. I believe that the very verses that we now read lay the foundation for Seventh-day Adventist doctrines and Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. We well, say, what about Revelation 14? The first, third, uh, second angel's message. Well, friends, how does verse 6 begin? And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. The very end time message which we have had, and we're going to come to it, is the gospel message. The most Christ-centered message that has been ever given to humanity. It's all good. All by grace. All by faith. All by Jesus and Jesus alone. And because we understand what Jesus has done, because we have seen how the Bible has portrayed Jesus, we say that we want to be loyal to God, not because we want to be saved by our own works, but as Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. There are so many people who are saying, Seventh-day Adventists, they believe in salvation by works. Oh no, no, that's a lie. As Seventh-day Adventists, this very verse lays the very foundation for Seventh-day Adventist thinking. That by grace, through faith alone in Christ Jesus, you have been saved. And not by your own works. And it is a what? Gift. It's a gift that we don't deserve. It's a gift which God has given us. And as we see this, by grace... Through faith, the most Christ-centered message which has ever been revealed to humanity. We're going to take a look at some of our beliefs soon. But I want to read a comment from the book Gospel Workers. Say, why talk about grace? Why faith? Gospel Workers. Of all professing Christians, Seventh-day Adventists, who? Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Christ before the world. When people look at us, what are they associating us with? Praise the Lord for vegetarianism, don't get me wrong. Praise the Lord for humanitarian work, and even the Sabbath. Of all professing Christians... Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Christ before the world. So what do you think when Adventists will come to the forefront of the world? What are they going to present? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. The most Christ-centered message that has been ever given to humanity. She continues. The proclamation of the third angel's message calls for the presentation of the Sabbath truth. Amen? That's right. But listen to how she continues. This truth, with others included in the message, is to be proclaimed. But the great center of attraction, who do you think that is? Christ Jesus must not be left out. She says, as the third angel's message is being preached, and as the Sabbath is being lifted up, she says, don't forget Jesus. As the Sabbath is being proclaimed, she says, don't forget what? The great center of attraction, Jesus Christ. So as we are coming out and as we are doing our public evangelism, as we are doing in our Bible studies, present the Sabbath, but she says, present it in Christ. You remember? The knowledge of the truth as it is in? It is at the cross of Christ that mercy and truth meet together and righteousness and peace kiss each other. The sinner must be led to look to Calvary with simple faith of a little child who must trust in the merits of the Savior, accepting His righteousness, believing in His mercy. 
The calling for us in these very last days is to lift up Jesus even more. Lift Him up in sermon. Lift Jesus up in a song. Lift up Jesus in prayer. And lift up Jesus in our day-to-day lives so that those who haven't read the Bible can read the Bible through our own lives. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer who said, Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. (laughs) Let us lift up Jesus. Amen? Amen. So as Seventh-day Adventists, we have many things in common with other Christians. We have, for instance, the Bible. We accept the Bible as the Word of God. We accept the Godhead. We accept the divinity of Jesus. We accept the death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And so, and so on and so on and so on. But today, I want to focus on our distinctive beliefs. What are we focusing on? Distinctive, distinctive beliefs. I know we had a tough week and I know it's a bit hot in here. But bear with me. Let us pray. Father in heaven, now we are truly getting into to a to the most important topic now, as we want to understand the knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. And help us to understand how it relates to our personal walk and in our personal lives. And help us truly to understand the ABCs of Seventh-day Adventism. <coughs> in Jesus' name, amen. Now we want to take a look at the distinctive beliefs that we hold so precious onto. They are so precious to us. And which perhaps Christianity and the rest of the world, they look down on us. And you are really doing that? And you really believe this? And and what, what, what is this? We want to clarify some of these things. And what I want you to see, as we are presenting, we will not be able to go in depth. But we will be able to see how these distinctive beliefs, which I believe are Bible based, are also centered at the cross. Centered in the person of Jesus Christ. One distinctive belief and which forms the worldview of so many of us is the great controversy theme. This is the notion that there rages a cosmic battle, a cosmic conflict between good and evil, between light and darkness, between truth and error, between God and a once perfect angel called Lucifer who once rebelled against God and became God's enemy, and he is Satan. And this conflict started in heaven, and it has come down to planet Earth. But this conflict is not a physical battle, but it is a spiritual battle, and it is a war for your mind. It's a war for your mind, and it all involves God's character. This is a conflict. This is a battle about God's character. And ever since the rebellion started, Satan has argued that God is not love, but God is selfish. God is not someone who tells lies, but God is a liar. And since God is a liar, God cannot be trusted. And we look out in the world, and we can say that Satan has done a pretty good job. Isn't that, the, isn't that how people understand the character of God? Selfish, liar, and someone who you cannot trust in? People say that, you know, how can God do such a thing as yesterday in, in Paris? I said, God didn't do anything. It was a violent extremist with a deadly ideology who did that. God didn't do that. God gave them the freedom, such as he has given you the freedom to come to this church or not. Are you with me? So this is a battle. These are some of the battles that are taking place. And the battle is centered upon the character of God. But 2,000 years ago, God has manifested His character for what He truly is in the most revealing way. And something that the universe has never seen. When Jesus came to this earth... And all God's creatures could see what God is like in action. When we look at Jesus and how Jesus is portrayed in the New Testament, we see what God is like. 
When we see Jesus healing a person, we see that God wants to heal us. When we see Jesus who is there and caring for somebody, I can understand that the same God is caring for me. When I see Jesus being tortured, when I see being Jesus bruised and beaten, and as he finally hangs upon that cross, I can see what God is really like. I can see a God who respects his creature's freedom. He's not hitting back. But he's being hit. And he respects yours and my consequences and of our actions. That is the God of the universe. Who is hanging upon that cross. And we can conclude that as he is hanging upon that cross. God is not selfish. Because he has laid down his life for us. So that through his death we may live. We don't call it selfishness. We call it selflessness. We call that agape. We call that real love. When we see Jesus hanging upon the cross, we don't see a liar. Because we truly see that the statement, the wages of sin is death. And God says, I don't want you to go away. I don't want you to be separated from me. I don't want you to be lost. So I will take yours and my sins so that through my death, you may believe. And because of What Jesus has done upon the cross. Because we can see that God is love. And God is someone who tells the truth. We can all conclude that God is someone to be trusted. Do you trust God? God is telling you I can be trusted. Just see the the life. The person of Jesus and what he did. And God says I'm the same. Jesus says you have seen the father. You have seen me. You see, the divinity of Jesus does not only prove that Jesus is God. The divinity of Jesus shows even more that God is like Jesus. Do you have that picture of Jesus, God as, he is, as Jesus was? This is what the great controversy is all about. And I believe one of the reasons why God has called the Seventh-day Adventist Church in these very last days is to counter Satan's arguments and to show to the world that there is a God who is love, that there is a God who is self-sacrificing, that there is a God who is telling the truth, and that there is a God whom you can trust. Any other distinctive belief? Come on, we are studying now. Any other distinctive belief? No. Sabbath. Well, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, seventh day, right? It's in our name. Sabbath. Other Christians, you know, they look at us because we observe the Sabbath and they say, here are those uh, Saturday keeping, Saturdayists, legalists, You know, these are pretty nice words. I mean, I was having an argument on Facebook with somebody because I was keeping the Sabbath. She says, I'm a devil worshiper. So these are pretty nice words. (laughs) Love of Christ, right? So why do we keep the Sabbath? Is it because we want to be these weird, strange, creepy, and almost sectarian people? No. Or do we... Keep the Sabbath. Because we have found that that is what the Bible says. Absolutely. Go with me to Exodus chapter 20. We are studying. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. We are now going to read the Ten Commandments. Which have been given to the Israelites. And most people actually, they don't have a problem with the Ten Commandments. You see, if you preach, don't steal, people stand up and they say, Amen. If you say, do not commit adultery, well, nowadays it's pretty, uh, but anyways, you you don't commit adultery, people say, Hallelujah, and they are clapping. But the moment you mention the fourth commandment, people getting an outburst. They say, how can you say that? And they come with all kinds of arguments. They say, oh, the law has been done away with. How many of you have... Heard that the law has been done away with. We shouldn't, we shouldn't keep the Sabbath. Um, 
There are so many fallacies within that argument. But the fact of the matter is, you ask the person, are you saved? And the person says, yes, I am saved. How are you saved? He says, I'm saved by the grace of God, by faith in Jesus Christ. All right. But how do you know that you have been saved? He says, I, it's because I've been a sinner. I say, yeah, you've been a sinner, and now you are saved. But how do you know that you were a sinner? Oh, I knew it because of the law. You knew because of the law that you were a sinner, and the law brought you to Jesus, and now you are saved, but you don't want to keep the law. Because it has been what? Done away with. But if it has been done away with, how do you know that you are a sinner? <laughs> People also say that the Sabbath is, all, is only for the Israelites, for the Jews. Is it, is it only for the Israelites? No. What did Jesus say? The Sabbath is for man, meaning it's for humanity. The Sabbath was instituted in a pre-fallen world, in creation, such as marriage. We see the Israelites are keeping the Sabbath. We see Jesus kept the Sabbath, not merely because he was a Jew, but because he was the creator who gave the law. And Jesus kept the Sabbath. The early disciples kept the Sabbath. The Sabbath is mentioned 84 times in the New Testament, in the book of Acts. Did you know that? The Sunday is mentioned once. What do you think God is trying to say? And then we take a look at the early church, and they are keeping the Sabbath. But please remember, we are asking ourselves as we are studying, we want to have a knowledge of the truth, but knowledge of the truth as it is in, how can we find Jesus in the seventh day Sabbath? Exodus chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 8. Exodus chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 8. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh is the day. Is, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You shall you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and made the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on. On the seventh day, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, let us study. According to the commandment, what are we not supposed to do? No work, right? According to the commandment, we are not supposed to work. But what is the opposite of work? Rest. The opposite of work is rest. You see, there are several words in the Hebrew for rest. And if you study this word and how it is used throughout the Old Testament, you see that this word has connotations not only to physical rest, but to spiritual rest. I could give you many examples, but for instance, uh, when Joshua and the armies were conquering in the Promised Land, when they believed in God, when they believed in the power of God, and when they conquered the land, the Bible says at the end of the book of Joshua that now, they had, now the land had rest. rest. It's the same word as it is in the Sabbath commandment. It's not only physical rest, but it's also spiritual rest. And this rest comes when we believe in God, when we believe in the power of God, and it automatically follows what? Rest. Rest. And I'm wondering to myself, what was one of the reasons why Jesus came to this planet? Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 tells us, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. rest. Jesus came to give us rest, and the Sabbath is all about rest. 
You see, all too often we have seen the Sabbath as simply physical rest from physical work. But I believe that it is about so much more. I believe that except the cross, the Sabbath is the greatest sign for what Jesus has done for us. You see, the Sabbath is a sign that we cannot work our way to heaven. But the Sabbath is a sign that we rest our way to heaven. Are you with me? The Sabbath is all about rest. It shows us who Jesus is. That he is the creator. In Deuteronomy, when the Ten Commandments are given, it, the, ten, the fourth commandment is in the context of redemption. You have been redeemed for the Egyptians. The Sabbath commandment tells us that it is Jesus who makes us justified by resting in Jesus. Ezekiel says that I have given the Sabbath as a sign. And what is it? That they may be sanctified. The Sabbath not only points us to justification. Sabbath points us uh, to justification. Sabbath points us to sanctification. That all this is not about the law. It's not even about the day. It's about Jesus. Amen. And when we have put our faith in Jesus, this justification and sanctification happens by grace through faith in Him. Amen. And the Sabbath is just a sign that you are resting yourself to heaven. Friends, do not let anybody tell you that by keeping the Sabbath, you are trying to be saved by works. The Sabbath is the, one of the most powerful arguments, one of the most powerful pictures that God has seen, that salvation is by grace through faith in the Son of God. Amen. And by the way, another word for rest in this context would be faith in Jesus. And how is Revelation chapter 14 verse 12 ending? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. There are other Bible translations which actually read faith in Jesus. The whole end time message is ending with faith in Jesus. You cannot preach the Sabbath without Jesus. You cannot live the Sabbath without Jesus. Because all you are, without Jesus, a legalist. And we don't want to le be legalist. Because Jesus says, come unto me, all ye who labor. All ye who want to be saved by your own works. I have not come. He says, I have come to give you rest. Rest. So how many of you want to rest? All of us should want to rest. We are now resting on the seventh day Sabbath. And by resting on the seventh day Sabbath, we acknowledge the supremacy of Jesus in our lives. Is it interesting? I find this study not because of me, but because of the word. That the centrality of Christ is indeed in our distinctive beliefs. What about the state of the dead? That's a distinctive belief. Most of Christianity and actually the rest of the world believes that when somebody dies, that person ends up either in heaven or in hell. But Jesus clearly said in John 11 about um, Lazarus, who had died, that he is doing what? That, I like that. He was resting. He was sleeping. He had put his faith in Jesus Christ. And he had died, absolutely, but he was Sleeping, he was resting, and when the second coming comes, resurrected. As Paul says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. The Bible teaches that human beings do not have an immortal soul. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia admits that. Did you know that? And those who have passed away are simply sleeping in their graves, they are unconscious of what is happening. But when Jesus will return, There'll be a resurrection for the righteous and a resurrection for the wicked. Now this is the knowledge of the truth, right? 
But we want a knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. How can a state of the dead glorify Jesus? Now go with me quickly to, we could go on to many uh, verses, but because of time we only go to one. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. As we read in the quote from Gospel Workers of all professing Christians, Seventh, the Adventists should be the foremost in uplifting Christ before the world. And we are trying to do that. Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 14. The Bible says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through what? Death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Verse 15, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You see, the wonderful news of the Bible is that God never created death. God never created death. Death came into our world as a consequence of our actions. Hence, the wages of sin is death. And many of us know People, wonderful people, dear people who have passed away. But Jesus upon the cross, through his death, he has conquered death. And those who choose to believe in him, or rest in him, or sleep in him, will at the resurrection be resurrected. When the dead in Christ shall rise. And all of us will join them. And this world full of sin, full of misery and full of death will be changed as it never was. And this planet will be recreated to its original beauty. And Paul says, we will always be with Christ. Do you want to be with Christ? Now is the time to be with Christ. Now is the time to sleep in Jesus. Now is the time to rest in Jesus. And now is the time to have faith in Jesus. Amen. Another distinctive belief is our understanding of hell. As you know, there are Christians who believe that hell is eternal. And that the devil is in charge of that place. Well, I respectfully disagree. <laughs> This doctrine, the doctrine of hell, has brought more people into skepticism, atheism, and in fear and hatred of God than any other doctrine I could ever think of. An overview of the Bible does not actually teach us that, the, that people are being, you know, grilled and, and uh, they are being in, in, in hell fire forever and ever. If you study in the Hebrew mindset what Hebrews understood the word forever it's not as we think it is it's just that there is a limited time and that's it I know it may come as a shock but that is what we find we could give many examples from the Bible but how can we find the knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus in the lake of fire doctrine or hell doctrine well I believe usually we see heaven or hell as a place and sure there is a physical heaven and there will be according to Revelation chapter 20 a physical lake of fire absolutely no 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 question about that but I believe that it is not so much about a place than a person heaven is not so much about a place than it is a person you see heaven is all about God you see most of us want to go to heaven and we want to play with dolphins, and we want to play with the, the animals, and we want to travel to different worlds, and, and so forth. And, and, and I believe we will. I believe we will. But heaven is all about Jesus. Heaven is all about God. And heaven is all about God's presence. Heaven is all about God's presence. So if heaven is God's presence, what is hell? Hell must be God's presence. Absence. 
The reason why there will be unfortunately many people who will end up in the lake of fire is because they have chosen God's absence in this life. And since their life and their character does not reflect God's character, which is likened to be a fire all throughout the Old Testament, when they come into contact with God, the Bible says that fire came down from heaven and they were consumed. This fire will not only obliterate sin in their lives, but since sin has been so deeply rooted in their hearts, even themselves will be destroyed because they cannot be in the presence of God. If they would be in the presence of God, you know what that would be for them? Torture? Hell. So it's almost a merciful act of God that this happens. But this is not so much that God is, that this is an act from God, that this is an arbitrary act from God. It's more like a choice which the sinner has brought upon himself because now is the time to repent. Now is the time to get rid of sin in our lives. Now is the time to run to Jesus who is our security. Are you having trouble in your lives? Are you having problem with a sin in your life a darling sin in your life which you are fighting with and having all these trials and you say God it doesn't work it doesn't work friends I have news for you run to Jesus run to Jesus and he will give you the power to overcome you know why I can say that because the Bible has promised it and because I'm experiencing it Day by day. Doesn't mean that I'm perfect. Oh no, I, oh, no, 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 don't even think that I'm perfect. But I'm experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in my life as He's taking all of these stuff out of me. And I said, whoa. But at the same time, God is showing me even more. That's why it's interesting. And lastly, I believe, based upon the books of Daniel and Revelation, that before Jesus returns... He would call a prophetic end time movement, a movement of destiny, to proclaim God's end time message found in the book of Revelation chapter 14, 6 to 12, where we see God's love on display, where God is trying to save a lost, rebellious planet. And I believe that He has called Adventists to do a mighty work for God. But this work is not only for Adventists. I mean, if you think about it, he calls anybody to be a part of this mighty movement. You have to remember that at the beginning of the Advent movement in the 19, uh, 1830s and 1840s, there were no Seventh-day Adventists around. There were all, what, Anglicans, and Baptists, and Catholics, and Methodists, and Presbyterians. And these people, they all came together, they studied their Bibles, they prayed to God, and now a movement was started. And out of that movement, the Seventh-day Adventist movement came about. And at that time, one of the most powerful revivals occurred. But I believe that the most powerful revival this world has ever seen is on the horizon. It's on the horizon. It is coming. This revival will be greater than the revival which was seen at the apostles' times. This revival will be greater than the revival which was seen in the Protestant Reformation. This revival will be greater and more powerful than the Advent revival. And the second Advent, and whatever you want to call this revival. And this will happen soon in our lifetime. I truly believe that. What the Holy Spirit will be falling as in the latter rain power. And the message of God will be proclaimed all around the world. And the words of Jesus will be fulfilled. That the end shall come. People all around the world will be shaken by God's end time message. Which is exposing the deceptions of Satan. And is at the same time unveiling the beauty and the true character of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. As Jesus is being lifted up 
for what he truly is, the coming King of kings and lords of lords. So why am, why am I a Seventh-day Adventist? It's first and foremost because our beliefs are Bible-based. But it is especially that our doctrines and our distinctive beliefs are portraying in the most powerful, biblical, Christ-centered way the character of God, which can be summarized with by grace through faith in Jesus you are saved. And it is a gift. How is it with your life? Friends, it's not enough to have a knowledge of the truth. But God is requiring of all of us a knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. Do you want to have this relationship with Jesus? Do you want to have this experience with Jesus that is word-based, that is based upon co communication with Jesus. I know that, you know, I live in London, you know, it's, it, it's tough. We see all around the devil is doing all kinds of things just to get us distracted. But in these last days, friends, God is asking us, not because of fear, but because of love towards him. Be with me. Walk with me. And get an understanding and knowledge of the truth as it is in, is this your wish? Is this your desire? Jesus is knocking upon your heart. If there's anybody here who hasn't made the decision to Jesus, now is that time. If you feel that you have wandered away from Jesus, and if you feel that, Jesus, I haven't been the best Christian, Jesus says, come back to me now. Because that's the beautiful thing with him. It's not only second chances. Remember, Third chances, fourth chances, tenth chances. Jesus says, come back to me while there is time. Jesus says, come back to me. But remember, don't go to Jesus because you are afraid. Go to Jesus because he loves you. And because he loves you, we respond to him by loving him back. And Jesus is saying, come to me. As we're going to sing a song now, Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance. And as we are singing, please listen to the words we are singing. And may these words, and as you contemplate upon what is being said during the sermon, may you take individually a decision for Christ that indeed this is the blessed assurance. Let us sing.
What are the ABCs of Seventh-day Adventism? What is, rather, Jesus? Where all our beliefs are centered in Jesus Christ. It's not about throwing away these doctrines. Oh no, these doctrines are beautiful. They are Bible-based. But even more beautifully as it is, they are centered at the cross. This is my story. Is it your story as we read, as we, as we were singing? It can be. And Jesus is just one prayer away. Remember that. Jesus is just one prayer away. The knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. That can happen to you. That can be your experience. We were singing it. This is my song. This is my experience. How many of you want this to be your experience, not only for next week, but until Jesus returns? Let me see. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for all that you have done. We are thankful for your word and how beautifully it portrays you as our creator, as our savior and redeemer. And who could have thought that these distinctive beliefs are so centered and focused upon Jesus and Jesus alone. Father in heaven, it is my prayer it is all of our prayers that may this be the experience of our individually. Amen. Father in heaven, may we have that knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus and may it happen now. Amen. Father, Father in heaven, I want to pray for those people who are struggling and they, they want to take this decision, yet you see that the devil is there and they... they, they it's hard to take this step for them, Father. Please be them and please guide them. Father in heaven, may this experience, may this song be this church's song. As we are now ready, not only to present knowledge, not only to present truth, but we are to present the knowledge of the truth as it is in your Son, Jesus Christ. May this become a reality, Father, and may this become a reality in this church life. Yes. Father in heaven, thank you for everything and for showing us that the ABCs of Seventh-day Adventism is all about Jesus and Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.